Hello, everyone. Uh, this is another uh, session of the Parker Office Hours. Uh, Parker Code of Conduct applies. You want, you may want to check the document uh, for the details of that, which I will just paste it in the chat. Basically, just try to be nice to each other. Uh, if you have any agenda items, it's the time to just add them. Otherwise, the agenda seems empty. We have some releases and we're going to talk about it but it's more or less it if you have any questions just go for it and add that to the agenda i was going to talk real quick about the um like storage efficiency changes that we merged a couple of days ago sounds super cool i will add that to the agenda and maybe i will find the pr as well yeah, i can find the pr real quick and uh, put it up, but if you want to, you can talk a moment about the releases. Yes, let me just quickly get it out of the way. Uh, last week, we finally got a new stable release for Parka and Parka Agent. For Parka, it's 0 0.12, and it, for Parka Agent, it, it is 0 0.9. So I guess uh, since we have been testing this on the uh, on our demo clusters and our pl production service for the past two weeks, and everything seems on track. So we can say that these are our most stable releases so far. And there are a couple of performance improvements uh, in Parka Agent and, and Parka as well. You can check the detailed change log. Uh, I already pasted the links into the document. I'm just checking out if we have any highlights that we haven't talked about in the previous office hours and I couldn't find anything. So for we even have some demos and whatnot. So just check out the previous office hours if you want to see any highlighted features uh, because we've been demoing and showing off all the uh, cool things that we built uh, throughout the time but we never actually pegged any releases that's what we did uh, in the in last week actually so i guess um now we can talk about the the newest cool things that we have with frost db and parka and for that you can take it away Frederick. all right so um, basically, a while ago, um, Cyril from Grafana opened an issue um, saying that, or like demonstrating that some of the um, storage bits aren't as efficient as they probably could be. He didn't necessarily say that. He was just like, um, some of this stuff literally doesn't um, use any com encoding or compression. And so, um, he wrote this little tool that I wanted to show real quick. Um, I think I need to actually share my whole screen. So I think you can see my screen. Is that right? Yes. So he wrote this tool um, <laughs> creatively called uh, Parquet Tool, where you can kind of pass a Parquet file into, and it'll kind of just print the schema and it give you a couple of high level details um, of what's included in this. So like the number of rows here, we've got 5 million, 5.5 million rows um, about, um, and that um, made up around 225 megabytes. And a couple of things uh, kind of stood out uh, when we were looking at this data, for example, duration um, is pretty, pretty large, um, 45 megabytes out of uh, those 225, so that makes 19%. Then again, period is also uh, really high. Um, PPROF um, number labels, I think this was maybe the most surprising one. Um, and then timestamp and value, all of which, whoops, sorry about that. Um, all of which uh, are about, you know, roughly 20%. And um, in comparison to all of this stuff, uh, all of the other columns are essentially, you know, almost free. So those were the ones that I uh, focused on. And um, the thing is with duration and period, they are basically um, constant. 
Uh, and so 45 megabytes is a huge amount of space completely wasted for these. Um, and so essentially, in order to allow me to uh, um, experiment with different encodings and later on also compressions, because as you can see, we actually, all of the um, uncompressed sizes um, are equal to the compressed sizes over here. So that shows you already we weren't using any compression algorithms before. Um, we were only using encodings. And so I wrote this little tool um, that I then creatively called Parquet Reencode. Um, and this tool essentially takes um, the Parquet file, um, the new schema, um, as well as then where we want to write the Parquet file to. And part of uh, making all of this work was actually to make our schemas uh, serializable, because up until this point, we actually always only defined them in Go code. Um, but now we can actually define them as uh, protobufs or as JSON using uh, JSON uh, PB. And um, that's essentially what I did. And taking this, um, this representation of the schema, I could do small changes on the schema and then immediately call the Parquet reencode tool and kind of reencode it and see how much better uh, we got. Um, and so I did a bunch of experiments. And ultimately, um, what I came up with, uh, sorry, let me show you the, the schema, the new one, actually. So the one that I started with was duration, right? So I just said, um, Duration is pretty much always a constant. So I decided to do a run length encoding and a dictionary encoding on this, just because uh, the dictionary encoding is not strictly necessary, but it just happens to be at least as efficient um, in, in Parquet. So it, it doesn't hurt to have that. Um, and then uh, the next one, same thing with the period. This is pr practically always. Um, a constant value. So again, we can use a run length encoding. PPROF labels. Um, I played around with this one a little bit um, because the compression was never as great as I wanted it to be. But ultimately, you know, running a couple of experiments, run length encoding, run run length uh, dictionaries actually end up being uh, the best one. Sorry, it's this one. Um, ended up kind of winning in in comparison to the others. There's definitely it seems like there's still room for improvement on this one. Um, yeah. Then uh, the next one, um, yeah, so timestamp and value. I ended up going with the delta binary packed um, encoding. So what this essentially does is it compares two consecutive values, um, and it only encodes the difference between these. Um, and this allows us to also kind of deduplicate those where there's no difference, for example. Um, and so this ultimately, because values tend to not change very much, um, actually yielded a really uh, decent improvement. And then ultimately, the three biggest remaining um, columns that we still had, I then also decided to apply um, the uh, ZSCD compression on, on top. Actually, I wanted to use LZ4, but it turns out there's a bug in Parquet Go right now um, that by now has actually been fixed. Um, but back then, I couldn't um, use LZ4. But LZ4 actually yields almost the same improvement while being significantly um, faster and doing a lot less allocations when doing performing the actual compression. And so long story, um, the, the thing that we then ended up having is this re-encoded uh, data. You saw that we had like 44 megabytes for these large columns, and we got them down to, in really good cases, you know, 44 kilobytes in the duration case, 6.2 kilobytes in the uh, period case. Um, as, as I said earlier, the num labels, they're still you know, higher than we probably want them to be. But uh, stack traces, timestamp, and value, again, also got significantly better. And here we can see where most of these improvements come from, right? Because we can see the uncompressed size is equal 
the compressed size because we're not actually compressing this at all, and it seems pretty unnecessary at 44 kilobytes. The the ones that we you know probably have some room for improvement still are people of num labels, um, stack traces, timestamps, and values. And here we can probably um, I already talked to the to the team at Tegman um, that uh, primarily maintains the Parquet Go library, and we were thinking about potentially adding. Um, custom encodings such as the Gorilla um, XOR encoding from Facebook, uh, which we've seen in time series data perform extremely well, um, even without adding any uh, kind of general purpose compression. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that's essentially that was the journey of um, of 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 improving the storage uh, efficiency and. The calculation of how we then got to 13.2x um, improvement was that we took this number and divided it by this, and we had 13.2. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt, right? All data is going to be slightly different, but I had a pretty diverse set of data in here, um, and we got it down to you know almost 18, 18 megabytes for what was almost 240 megabytes before. So yeah, that's it. Any questions about any of what I just said? Thanks for sharing, Frederick. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I probably haven't done too much reading into this, but uh, is it uh, when you compress a column, is it uncompressed at read time or what? So mm, how does that work? Yeah. So um, the, the they're essentially uh, chunks of data, right? So we we store the um, the data in columns, and these columns are then stored in chunks, and each of these chunks are compressed. Um, so then at read time, when we actually want to read whatever data is in that chunk, that's when we need to uh, decompress it. Nice. And that's probably, you know, Z ZSDD is, is a modern, really good compression algorithm, but it probably, for the kind of workload that we have, it's probably not ideal, which is why in the long term we're probably going to want to switch to LZ4. Uh, like I said, um, and actually we can run this experiment right now. Um, so we, uh, I'm just going to run the. Oops, I don't have. Um, we can run the experiment right now for what it would be like. Um, I just need to recompile the Parquet Go at uh, the reencode. Tool. Let me do that. Um, these two tools, by the way, are in the FrostDB um, repo. Uh, no, just making sure. Maybe they have some changes there. Build the new version of the tool. Um, uh, Reencode thing. Sorry, we need to actually change the schema. Um, that's the old schema. We want to change the new schema. So this is, it's called LZ4 underscore raw um, as well. So now we can run the, uh, three encodes, and now we can see, okay, yeah, the, the change is, you know, minuscule. Um, but we, at least from experience, we can we've seen that the um, runtime of um, LZ4 is significantly faster than uh, ZSCD. So, uh, like I said, we need to run a couple more experiments um, on this, but it seems like it's almost identical um, in terms of the efficiency that we're going to get from this. Go ahead, Jimmy. When you uh, like 
I don't know if you guys have made any changes to the schema yet. Uh, when you do, do you guys write like any migrations or anything across versions to make sure that like the whole like existing databases get upgraded to the new format? Like, do the Parquet tools help you with that? So um, we so Parquet Go has a couple of um, utilities to I forget exactly what they're called, but it's like schema evolutions or something like that. I think maybe Julian knows. Um, I, I think you're from the um, segment team, right? Yep. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there, there's, there's something about how you can evolve schemas. Um, but uh, the reality of how our um, query engine actually works is that as long as schema changes are additive, um, we actually don't see, or even, even if you remove the column, that wouldn't matter. Um, everything would still work the same way. Same thing with um, encodings and compression. All of the previous um, databases, essentially, because each parquet block um, of data is essentially its own um, database. Um, so those will, would all still work. The thing where it would become problematic would be if we changed a column. Let's say we changed the type of a column. That's something we wouldn't be able to handle actually today. So that's something where we would need to actually either you know convert the data at read time, or we would need to run some sort of migration over the data. Yeah, th uh, these encodings that you're demonstrating, though, they would require that, right? Because they, like the column would already be encoded differently. So if you want to get the same kind of win in the storage efficiency, yes. But the um, like it wouldn't automatically do that migration. You're absolutely right about that. Um, so that's that would be something where we would require some tooling to do that to automate that. Um, but at least the querying would still work. Um, you know, it, because we would be reading two hundred. 40 uh, megabytes instead of uh, 24, it would be s slower because that uh, requires um, like disk operations. But um, overall, reading this data would still be possible, at least. Any other questions? Is the bug in LZ4 related to like the Go LZ4 implementation? Or I guess not. OK. I just want to make sure I'm like, oh, no, can I not use that? <laughs> I, I forget exactly what, what the bug was. Um, we can dig up the, the issue. I, I, I should fix that bug, right? Yeah, I shall, I shall fix it, yeah. Like a few hours after I reported it to him. <laughs> It's crazy sometimes how fast he is. So there, there was something about how the Parquet Go library handled situations where LZ4 determines this content is not compressible, which might still be something that you, an edge case that you might want to look at <laughs> um, because. Uh, yeah, it has kind of an interesting, or at least in Parquet Go, we needed to introduce a, a special case for this to handle it appropriately. But if you're just using it as like the compression scheme on like gRPC or something, it's probably already handled appropriately. All right, that's it. Cool. Any other questions or comments? No? OK. Julian has already uh, wrote something on chat to just like introduce himself. Maybe, Julian, do you want to do it also online? Sure. Um, so my name is Julian. I've been working with this in, like, I've been working at Segment for a while now, um, where we're working on uh, Parquet Go, the Parquet Go library, 
Um, and right now I'm trying to provide continuous profiling to all segments and Twilio, um, which is quite a few EKS pods and Kubernetes pods. Um, so yeah, right now I'm, I'm trying to target a few big clusters with a lot, a lot of pods in there. Um, so facing a few challenges, but yeah, so far it has been, it has been great. Thank you for, for that backup product. It's awesome. That's awesome to hear. I, I would, <laughs> if I can make a suggestion, maybe do it the other way around. Start with the smaller clusters and uh, it's yeah. done already. Yeah, ah, no, okay. yeah, we 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 did we did the, the rollout on a few few uh, few clusters. Um, but yeah, now I want to see how it's going to behave on really beefy cluster with thousands of pods and everything. Um, and and I'm, I'm I'm mostly targeting right now. Cluster that are that are owned by teams that are that cares about performance and want to uh, improve their 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 services. Um, to add a bit of context, hundred percent of segment is in Go, um, so we we do a lot of profiling already. Um, but yeah, having but so far we have been doing profiling. On and off, you know, just looking at what profile. So adding the continuous aspect of the profiling is very, very interesting for us. That's that's super cool. Um, yeah, I I think we still need to actually try latest main on on the demo cluster. So um, I can do that as well, and also let you know there. I definitely know there was a bug at some point on main, um, but I I want to say I fixed it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but as long as you're not running it as uh, like with the storage enabled, you should be totally fine. Like worst case, you roll it back to uh, zero twelve. Sounds good. Yeah, well, I will probably test the main branch today. Cool. Excited to hear how, how that how that goes. Yep. Actually, with that amount of data, um, you, you're probably even going to start to run into like um, latency issues um, on the. On the querying end, um, and one uh, really cool change that's uh, still pending on FrostDB, but it's it's ongoing work, um, is actual like parallelization of the query engine. Um, right now, it's kind of si single threaded, you could say, um, which is kind of nice actually. For we don't need any synchronization in the entire um, query pipeline. But it also means that we can only run it on one CPU, basically. Um, obviously, that's not, not ideal. Um, so we want to run it essentially on the amount of cores that you have available to your machine, um, and then only merge all of the data once all of it ha has been processed by each uh, CPU. So that on each CPU, we can still go without any synchronization, and then only when we're merging it into the final result. Good. Is that where you are looking at Arrow Flight? Um, so so Arrow Flight is different, right? It, it, it's to fetch. Like you can fetch data from multiple endpoints at once, and not necessarily. That's right. So, so, basically. so the, the thing the thing that's pending on FrostDB right now is is in process. Yeah. Um, but it's actually generic enough that it could be could be in a distributed setting. So, like. Being totally transparent here, like Polar Signals actually has a distributed version of this database um, where we are using Arrow Flight as the exchange format between nodes in the distributed database. Sounds good. All right, cool. I'm super, super excited to hear um, how it goes uh, for you. And yeah, it's super excited to, uh, yeah, just. It's cool. It was cool to see the like numbers even <laughs> of the of the clusters. That's always exciting. The best part about building software is when people actually use it, right? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Totally. All right. Any other agenda items or anything you would like to discuss? Well, I can I can quickly chat about an experiment that I'm doing as well. Uh, this this one is not with Barca, but only for SDB. Um, at segment, we are building an like 
we are working on uh, a storage engine similar to FrostDB using Parkago and whatnot, which is why we have been building Parkago, right? To store open telemetry traces, spans, traces, and whatnot. Um, and I was thinking to just run an experiment, to just use FrostDB to see how it goes. But there is some interesting internal, there is some interesting differences internally between FrostDB and the thing that we are using. Um, for example, the thing that we're building is using an LSM tree um, for the, the data. Um, so we'll see how it goes. The, the thing that I think could be very interesting is we are also looking at Apache Arrow and Arrow Flight and data fusion and all these kind of things. And I have a sense that there is some interesting collaboration that could happen there um, between our two teams, even though if in the end we decide to keep going with our internal database, just having the common query layer could be very interesting. We are also going to get data out of S3 or whatever blob storage we're going to use. Um, we are also going to need to be able to slice and dice the data, to do aggregation and whatnot. So it's going to be very, very similar. Um, maybe the, the, the um, if we put the LSM tree aspect out of the, the thing, maybe it's something that's going to be very different, that the schema that we are going to run is going to be very static because we kind of know in advance it's just going to be for open telemetry data. So we have the schema of open telemetry, um, which is going to give us um, abilities to do some optimization very for that specific data set. Um, but otherwise, the, the query layer could be mostly the same, right? Um, so yeah, it was interesting to to hear your thoughts about that, if we could maybe look into building some common libraries or common query layer. And... Yeah, I think it's de definitely, there's definitely lots of interest um, to collaborate there. I think the, the query engine actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it wasn't built with that in mind, but um, uh, everything is already interfaces. So mm -hmm. like the interfaces you could actually implement already and um, that way read the data from your, from whatever, however you lay it out, right? It's basically just, just an iterator, <laughs> like, yeah. No, it's, it's nothing nothing else um the the interface does um carry a, a lot of the things that we use for optimizing reads um so like it pushes down things like these are the distinct um columns that we're querying right like like an sql distinct type query or these are the filters that we're querying by so that we can like utilize the parquet index uh, to not read all the files, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think there's there's a lot of uh, potential there. Yeah, like there's there's no 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 reason really for either of our teams to duplicate work here. Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah, I will uh, I will I will let you know. I will keep going on my experiments with FOSDB and see see how it goes. Um, we we'll probably have some update for the next call, probably. Cool. Yeah. That's exciting. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, because at least from what I understood on when we were chatting on Slack, I, I understand that you store like open telemetry attributes as like a struct in um, Parquet. Yeah, so right now we, we are not yet on Parquet. Uh, soon, uh, but we, we are still, we're still trying to figure out what will be the design. Right now, we, we don't use Parquet. We are still, we are still using our previous version of things, um, which has been fast for many, many reasons. Like we use an LSM tree, we only index attributes, um, but really key value attributes. We don't do maps and everything. Um, so it, it's, it's already in production and we do something like, in prod, we do about 3 million span per second. Um, so it's it's working great. Now we want, and the, the reason why we are building this particle is now, now we want to be able to 
to get the same data and slice and dice everything and give our developer the ability to just query whatever they want, dig into whatever data they want, don't have to care about cardinalities and so on and so forth. So our, our parquet implementation is still very, very experimental and in progress, yeah. We have been, we have been focusing on the library itself to make sure that when we are going to start the implementation of the actual database, it's, that thing is going to be as fast as what we have right now. Um, and there is still a ton of work there, but yeah, we, we, are, we are getting there, yeah. That's that's really exciting. P part of why I mentioned this is because in FrostDB, we only support flat schemas, basically. Yeah. Um, so this might end up being a problem for you. But you could always <laughs> make the attributes. Um, you, you could flatten them, essentially. Although I'm not 100% not sure if like lists are allowed in OpenTelemetry. Uh, they, so in open telemetry attributes, you have yeah you have li now in open in a, a span you can have a list of attributes or it is a map of attributes. I will have to take a look. Yeah, but yeah, there is list and map and every uh, like if, if you can arbitrarily nest it, that's that that might end end up being a problem. But if it's just like nesting where you can do like status dot. Yeah, I think I think we're gonna do that. Yeah. So that's something that we could always flatten in FrostDB um, and make it a dynamic column essentially. Um, but the rest could be like if it's if it's more complex than that, it might not not actually be possible today. But yeah, I, I think right now uh, right now we do because we do only so on the DB that we're working on because we only allow you to query per label tag, very Prometheus like. Uh, in the end, we have HTTP status, HTTP dot status dot blah blah blah. So yeah, so I guess it it could work. That 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 should that should work. Yeah, as as long as there's no arrays allowed within yeah. this nesting, everything should be okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, I will keep that in mind. Sounds good. Cool. Excited to see and hear how that goes. All right. Cool. I guess that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. And yeah, special thanks to Julian. It was a really fruitful discussion between our teams. So you're always welcome. Come join, say hi, Sounds good. like everyone else. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I guess that's it for this week. Uh, so see you all in two weeks, I guess. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.